Uh, and we are, uh, we are here for now the, the final session on um, institutional issues about judicial involvement with politics. Uh, I am uh, particularly looking forward to this. Uh, it, is a, it is the most uh, interdisciplinary of our sessions and uh, we have a number of people on this panel we are uh, uh, happy to uh, to uh, uh, welcome back. Uh, again, starting from my immediate right uh, is um, Mike Salamini from the University of Cincinnati College of Law. Um, Mike and I go back a very long way. Uh, and uh, uh, last night at dinner I told him that uh, uh, I'm on our law school uh, class reunion committee and one of the things that I need to do before he leaves town is to hit him up for some money for the class gift. Um, but uh, Mike has done a lot of very good work uh, on uh, federal courts and is the co-author of a new uh, book on election law. Uh, beside Mike is Margo Anderson, uh, an urban and social historian from the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee. Uh, among her many works uh, is a terrific book on the U.S. Census that was written um, a few years ago while she was a visiting professor of history here on campus. Uh, our uh, third speaker is uh, Michael Altman uh, from from uh, Harvard, who is a, uh, a statistical uh, 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 person, uh, for the uh, senior research scientist, it says Institute, of the time. Institute for <laughs> Quantitative I'm Social person, Science, right. okay. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, Michael McDonald, who is a political scientist at George Mason University. Um, it seems to me that you know, there's something odd about this, this background. We have two George Mason faculty and we've got uh, uh, as well, uh, two Atlantans here. Uh, our uh, our last person uh, is a pleasure to welcome back, Neil Kinkoff. Uh, uh, Neil was my student uh, many years ago. Uh, uh, Neil was the kind of student you kind of uh, love to have, but also dread because you know that he's going to keep you on your toes. Uh, uh, Neil uh, also um, is a former colleague of mine. Uh, and uh, he is, uh, at least in my time, I would say uh, one of the uh, all-time uh, great editors-in-chief of our law review. So I'm looking forward to this session. Let me turn things over to Mike and we'll go from there. So th this, uh, first of all, thanks for the, uh, the generous introduction and the opportunity to uh, uh, participate in this wonderful uh, uh, symposium. So th this panel, the topic, the panel, the, the, the title of the panel is just uh, right for me because um, um, I, I want to back away a little bit from the, the uh, Baker opinion itself per se, not be so court-centric and talk about other institutions, other institutions that relate to Baker versus Carr and, and subsequent um, reapportionment and related uh, litigation uh, like the, under the Voting Rights Act. So the, the topic of my paper is Congress, the Solicitor General, and the path of reapportionment litigation. So I want to talk about the, the, those, two, uh, the, the, those two institutions, which certainly doesn't exhaust the universe of private and public institutions that, you know, can be that, that, uh, uh, that relate to, um, to, to reapportionment um, litigation. And so I think the, 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 the paper has both a kind of descriptive and normative component to it. Part of it is just to, you know, just to uh, uh, describe how these other institutions have impacted um, uh, reapportionment litigation. And indeed, the re reverse is true, how reapportionment litigation has impacted those other um, uh, in institutions and, and also, at least implicitly, ask, uh, you know, is it a good or bad thing uh, uh, and what exactly do you mean by that in, in, in this context? So, so before getting to talk, talking about the Solicitor General and Congress, uh, um, uh, 
in, in, in that order, just very briefly, wanted to um, uh, indicate and uh, talk a little bit about uh, Baker versus Carr itself and building on what Professor Ishikaroff and others have said about um, the case. I think it's fair uh, to say that the conventional wisdom today, at least, is that Baker versus Carr, after being briefly controversial, uh, quickly came to be um, uh, accepted. And this is often contrasted to the more controversial Warren Court uh, cases. So one. Uh, just as one of many examples of that, uh, uh, of that kind of current view of, of, of Baker um, is that someone in 2006 said the following, this is in 2006, it is difficult to imagine in this day and age any serious objection to the rights identified in Baker versus Carr and subsequent reapportionment cases. That was Professor Samuel Ishikaroff uh, testifying to Congress in 2006 during the uh, hearings uh, to, uh, to confirm Samuel Alito to the U.S. Um, uh, 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 Supreme Court. But, um, uh, but in fact, as uh, Professor Shkaroff and others ha have written, in the early 1960s, I think it's fair to say, late 50s, early 60s, that it, w it, was, it wasn't inevitable, despite its later, yes, quick acceptance, relatively quick acceptance. I think that the, the Baker litigation and the reapportionment issue in general w w was, uh, at least the way I see it, w w w uh, was not completely inevitable, was indeed controversial um, uh, 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 for its time. I mean, it's been mentioned some of the reasons that the that due in part to the Cole Grove um, versus um, a Green case and other cases the in the uh, 40s and 50s, the lower federal courts were, uh, and state courts were relatively passive on this issue. Uh, the, uh, uh, there was not a great deal of movement um, in, in, in the states, much less the federal level um, in Congress or elsewhere to change the, the, uh, the, 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 mal the many malapportioned uh, uh, districts, despite people lamenting ab about them, there was you know, very little uh, uh, being done about it, I guess I'm saying. So, so hence, you know, uh, despite its later acceptance, Baker was, I think it's fair to say, from, uh, when you look at the state of the you know, politics at the time, what, what was a, 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 indeed a controversial matter. And I don't, at least the way I see it, I don't think it was inevitable that the, you know, the, the, the Baker uh, decision came out um, um, uh, as it did, and I think, uh, uh, without going into all the uh, uh, details, I think at least the immediate aftermath of Baker, by which I mean that like the next two years up to the Reynolds versus Sims decision, well, it, it was pretty um, controversial. Even though, yes, it, you know, it fairly rapidly and perhaps, perhaps surprisingly, perhaps not after that, it came to be um, uh, accepted. So, so the reason I, I, I point that out is just as a preface to talk about the, uh, the Solicitor General and Congress's kind of reaction to it. I think that's an important, perhaps unappreciated part of the story, which kind of, at least uh, as I see it, affects reapportionment litigation up to the present uh, day um, as well. So, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the Solicitor uh, General. Professor Shkaroff talked about this as well. He mentioned that the U.S. got involved in the Baker uh, uh, litigation, and that's true, but not as a party. The U.S. wasn't a party, but rather uh, the United States, through the Solicitor General, filed uh, a what has come to be seen as, as, a, as an influential uh, amicus curry, friend of the court, um, brief. And as, as probably many of you uh, know, over the years, or certainly the post-World War II um, era, the Solicitor General has filed, um, uh, has, uh, with, with regard to all its work, I guess, representing the United States before the Supreme Court, but, but in addition, as part of that, is filing friend of the court briefs in cases before the Supreme Court. The, the, the uh, Solicitor General uh, almost always has enjoyed a, a, a very high reputation, both on the court and off the court, for, for uh, for writing pro uh, highly professional and, and helpful, high quality um, um, amicus uh, uh, briefs. And among other things, this has enabled the, the presidency, the president, through the Solicitor General to explicitly or implicitly advance policy uh, objectives one way um, uh, or the other. I guess you know, a great example of this would be Brown, the uh, Brown versus Board of Education, where the Eisenhower administration, through the Solicitor General, filed uh, a, 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 a amicus brief in support of um, uh, uh, desegregation. Likewise, it is often said that these Solicitor General briefs can also deliver information, uh, 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 and at least in the minds of some, kind of more objective in, um, information to the uh, to the uh, court. Uh, there's some indication that, that the Supreme Court review, you know, sees favorably the 
uh, of use favorably and helpful most of the time, the amicus briefs filed by the Solicitor General, and indeed even in some people who have studied this say that, that, the, uh, that, that the, uh, the amicus brief by the Solicitor General can be a signal of support on a controversial issue, if it, that, that the, the Supreme Court might uh, be willing to you know, spend some of its political capital, if that's the right way to put it, if they know ahead of time they have the support of, of the presidents uh, through the Solicitor um, uh, general. So, so, so how did this play out in, in, in um, uh, Baker? Again, I don't, uh, you know, Professor Shkaroff and all others have talked about this, uh, um, uh, but just uh, uh, briefly, uh, and, and others have, have, have written about uh, this, and I've referenced this um, in, in the paper, but the plaintiffs, the plaintiffs in Baker versus Carr actually lobbied, lobbied both the Eisenhower administration and the, the incoming Kennedy administration to file an amicus brief on their behalf, and indeed they succeeded. Um, um, uh, the, the, I, 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 as I read the historical record, I think if, if Richard Nixon had won the presidency, his, his administration would have filed an amicus brief in favor of the plaintiffs in Baker versus Carr. I'm not sure everyone uh, would agree with that, but a part of my evidence for that is a case that I don't think has been mentioned yet in, in this uh, openly in this symposium, but the, the late in the Eisenhower administration, uh, the, the Solicitor General's office filed a brief in support of the plaintiffs in Gomillion versus Lightfoot from 1960, kind of a, a, a case uh, uh, authored by Justice Frankfurter, no less, that found for the, unanimously found for the plaintiffs in that case, and that, that's, that, that's a little bit of a precursor in some ways to, to, to Baker versus Carr. But, but at any rate, there was lobbying, um, and it was proved to be receptive. Uh, uh, President Kennedy and his brother, the Attorney General, Robert Kennedy, uh, were for a variety of political and other reasons receptive to, to the idea of filing an amicus brief in Baker as, as they did. And as was mentioned, Archibald Cox, the Solicitor General, eventually files that brief in favor of the plaintiffs and participates in her whole argument. But what's interesting um, uh, to me is that Cox was actually reluctant, reluctant to do this. So how, how, how could that be? Well, he was a student at Harvard Law School of then Professor Felix Frankfurter. Um, and also, uh, 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 Cox uh, was, uh, uh, was genuinely uh, uncertain about the role of federal courts in this, um, 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 or, uh, um, in this area. He, he was unsure about how to, you know, how much, if at all, federal courts should intervene in, in, um, um, uh, in this process. So this, this people have written about this, have these wonderful stories about how Cox and JFK and RFK and others kind of negotiated what should appear in the uh, a friend of the court brief. It was, it was eventually filed and it, um, it, it kind of took a moderate position that it wasn't a political question, but kind of didn't say a whole lot about what the, what the substantive standard of review is. The brief, for example, didn't say anything about one person, um, um, uh, uh, one vote. And kind of in indicative of, of Cox's ambig ambiguity about the whole thing is that uh, people have written about this say that um, um, uh, say that after the, it was actually orally argued twice, and after the second oral argument, Cox, he had participated in it, he had undergone withering questioning and oral argument by Felix Frankfurter, and as he was going out of the Supreme Court chambers, he said to, Archibald Cox said to one of his, said to one of his colleagues, Felix Frankfurter is right. This is, you know, Archibald Cox, who just argued the other sides, and reliable, there's several reliable sources say that, that Cox said that on his way out of um, oral argument. Well, despite that, as you know, you know, of course, you know, Baker goes in favor of, of the position advanced by the, uh, the, the, the Solicitor General, and uh, all the sources say that, that, that the, 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 um, the Solicitor General's brief was influential, even though it's not cited anywhere in the opinion. We have the opinion in our materials, and unless I missed it, the Solicitor General's brief is, is nowhere cited in any of the um, uh, opinions. Nonetheless, the people who have written about it say that it was influential. Reports of the, 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 the conference deliberations among the justices in the case say to have them talking about the Solicitor General's brief. So that and other evidence suggest it was influential. Kind of a similar story with regard to the, um, you know, the other reapportionment cases from 1963, 1964 that, uh, that has already been uh, talked about Reynolds and other cases. The, the Archibald Cox filed amicus briefs in those cases. Um, 
um, in, um, in support of the plaintiffs, and you know th those were thought to be influential as well, even though they're not much cited by, by the at least in those opinions by the uh, Supreme Court. I guess I must say on that point, uh, you know, speaking of citation, that you know not, simply because it wasn't cited doesn't mean it's it wasn't influential, and this reverse is true as well. Just because it's cited doesn't necessarily mean it was it was usually. Um, um, uh, influential. So, uh, bringing that part of the story up up up, up to the present um, uh, uh, t time in, in the paper, I go I go into some more detail and give more examples of how the Solicitor General and, it's of course, in later administrations, uh, filed amicus briefs in in later reapportionment and other important election law um, uh, cases and Voting Rights Act cases. So, I won't uh, go into that. I will briefly uh, uh, say though that that it's at least a little bit curious uh, uh, to me that Solicitor General, I don't want to overstate the point, has not, you know, participated as when the when when the U.S. is a party. Obviously, these uh, to, to any of these cases, the U, the Solicitor General represents, you know, the the U.S. and th there's no amicus brief filed. Um, um, uh, um, so it's only when the U.S. is, is um, uh, not a party. But I don't want to overstate the point that it's not like in every single, you know, subsequent case the U.S. has participated as. Uh, um, as amicus, but it, it, it's it's it, it's a little curious to me that that in some kind of high-profile cases, the U.S. Uh, when it had an uh, opportunity to file an amicus brief, it did not. Um, uh, j just a couple uh, uh, quick examples of that. We, we talk a lot about partisan gerrymandering, and the Vieth case from 2004, the Supreme Court said 5-4 uh, with, with no majority opinion that we're not going to intervene in this particular case. In fact, it was a political question, basically, the, the Scalia plurality opinion said. The, the U.S. did not file an amicus brief in that um, uh, case, nor did it perhaps absurd as it may sound, nor did the Solicitor General file an amicus brief in Bush versus Gore, speaking of Bush versus Gore. And um, um, uh, I'm not quite entirely sure what that, um, um, uh, with, 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 what, you know, what that tells us, but you know, they participated, it, the Solicitor General participated influentially in, in Baker versus Carr and yet did not participate in, in, in Bush versus uh, uh, Gore. So, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move on to, uh, or, uh, to, to Congress, and so uh, time constraints prevent me from going into any de detail, but it's been written about well by lots of other people about the, the negative reaction and, and bipartisan at that, too, I might add, in Congress in 62, 63, 64 to these uh, decisions. Uh, uh, Senator Ed, um, Everett Dirksen, the, the uh, well-known Republican minority leader from Illinois, famously spent a lot of political capital unsuccessfully opposed uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Baker versus Carr and these other decisions, he pushed, uh, he and others pushed um, a constitutional amendment to limit over overrule Baker and later cases and, and uh, bills that would have restricted uh, federal court jurisdiction over reapportionment cases. They never passed, but they, they, some of them passed one house and not the other. They, they had, you know, significant, uh, albeit temporary, um, uh, uh, support so that that was all you know that all faded away by the uh, late 1960s. What I uh, in in the small time I have remaining, I want to talk about something Congress did do, however, that that applies to the present day, and that's this institution that us folks in the federal courts arena at least pay attention to, the three judge district. Um, uh, court and this was something created by Congress in 1910. 1910 for uh, to to hear challenges to statewide practices, federal court challenges, constitutional challenges to statewide um, um, practices, and rather than just have a single federal district judge hear the case with normal appellate review thereafter, there will be uh, three judges convened. It's called a three judge district court, but actually under the statute it's a single circuit, it's almost always a single circuit judge and two district judges are, are convened to hear the case with direct, a direct appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. So that was in, in 1910, and actually Baker versus Carr is a three judge district court case because it was, it was a challenge to the Tennessee statutes involving um, um, the reapportionment, Reynolds versus Sims, and some of these other well-known cases were all three judge district court cases. Um, um, th themselves. So uh, fast forward to 1976, a uh, real interesting and, and puzzling to me change in, in that statute for other reasons, because it was an administrative burden to the federal court system, at least some, so some people argued, and because um, it was thought to be unnecessary, um, the, 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 th the three judge district court was abolished, was, was abolished, meaning that, you know, all the cases would just go through the normal 
uh, litigation, federal court cases will go through the normal litigation process thereafter, with, with one exception. The exception being that, that the, the three judge district court was left intact, statutory left, statutorily left intact, for reapportionment cases. And so, you know, wh why, why is that? Well, I, I, I've, you know, looked over this um, and written about it previously, and I'm, I remain puzzled by, by, by it. The, there is some legislative history about why they left it intact, but I, I, you know, I, 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 I uh, it's unclear to me, I guess is what I'm saying. The, what little legislative, the, there is some, not much, but it says, among other things, that the, the drafters of, uh, of the change in 1976 thought that reapportionment cases were important that's the word they used. They were important, and that it was necessary to have a three-judge district court as opposed to a single district judge uh, hear the case because of, of the need for the public acceptance, quote unquote, the public acceptance of reapportionment decisions. So I'm not quite sure what all that um, 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 means. If, if, in, if in some you know, qualitative way reapportionment cases are more important, quote unquote, I'm not entirely sure. I guess the idea is that, well, three heads are better than than, than one um, on these sort of things for reapportionment uh, cases and some, some notion that a direct appeal w would you know, quickly resolve the case or quickly get it up into the US Supreme Court to resolve it one way or the other. Likewise, I guess the idea is, although I, you know, I'm not quite sure how you would empirically um, demonstrate this, that three district judges or you know, a three judge district court hearing a reapportionment case would, however it ruled, would be better accepted somehow by the interested public uh, uh, or just even by the legal community um, or, or, or something. Uh, I guess there's some you know, logic there, but I'm not quite sure how you would you know, me measure that, and I'm not quite sure you know, about the direct appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, how that, uh, how, how that um, uh, plays out. So, so um, uh, if I can just briefly uh, conclude here, I, uh, the, the, uh, just on the, the three-judge district court uh, business. So, so that, that's how, you know, that, that's, since Congress has been relatively passive as, uh, under the elections clause to, uh, with regard to these uh, things. And one, one of the few things, at least the way I see it, is the Congress has done with regard to reapportionment cases is, is to have this kind of unique federal court institution, the three judge district court remaining to hear these cases. So, you know, one might ask, well, what difference has that made uh, uh, since 1976? Um, uh, and, and, and it's hard to, um, uh, it, it seems to me, for some of the reasons I just mentioned, it's hard to say. But I want to uh, briefly talk about three things about how one might gauge if it's made any um, in, in difference, and, and then I'll end. Um, w w w uh, w the first thing is that there's been some uh, talk over the years and some concerns about the chief judge of the circuit, the three, uh, the three judges on a three judge district court. One of them is the district judge before whom the case is originally filed, and then the circuit, the chief judge of the circuit, gets to a point. Um, um, uh, two other judges. And so over the years, there's been some anecdotal evidence of what's called stacking, panel stacking, that the chief judge of the circuit, for partisan reasons or political reasons or you know, outcome determinative reasons, would stack the panel with certain federal judges who he or she thinks would rule in a certain way. That's been the charge, and it must be said, there's at least some anecdotal evidence that that happens um, uh, uh, sometime. And, 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 uh, um, and an example of that I'll, I'll quickly uh, share with you is, is the Ohio litigation or potential Ohio litigation that, that we're talking about with regard to uh, what's going on in Ohio right now. Uh, Dan would know this better than, than I, but so far as I know, there hasn't been a, you know, a case, a federal court case filed yet. I, that may be in the, you know, in the near future or something, I don't know, but it, you know, such a case has not been filed yet. So, so in the wake of the Ohio Supreme Court decision of just a few weeks ago that said there could be a referendum over the, you know, uh, over the map, and I don't know if events today might change that in the Ohio General Assembly, I don't know. But, but, but when uh, um, uh, 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 there was a talk a couple of weeks ago about the prospect, the prospect of a federal court intervention. So this is, uh, this is in the Cincinnati Enquirer a couple of weeks ago. It says, had a story about all this. It says, Ohio House Speaker William Batchelder, William Batchelder said in a statement that Republicans in the legislature warned the public, warned the public that the, the, the Democrats' plan would stymie the General Assembly's duty to draw maps so on and so forth, and, and ultimately have a map imposed on Ohio by unelected federal judges, I like that, unelected federal judges, who may be judges from Michigan, Kentucky, and Tennessee. 
right? I guess that would be the ultimate insult, right? I mean, not only <laughs> unelected federal judges, but three from outside Ohio. What, what an insult. But I think he's talking about the three justice yeah. court. And he is right. I mean, you know, tech, technically, he is correct that depending on uh, uh, well, actually, he's wrong because at least one of them would be from Ohio, right, before whom the case was filed. But technically, the you know the two others could be federal judges from outside Ohio. Uh, work I've done and others have done, however, show that uh, that in past three judge district court decisions of all kinds, including reapportionment cases, it's extremely rare. Almost always, the chief judge of the circuit will. I mean, it, like literally 95 plus percent of the time, the chief judge of the circuit will will um, appoint federal judges from the state where the reapportionment is. is going on. Uh, two other things uh, uh, real quick. The, 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 you know, uh, we've talked a little bit about partisan decision making by judges, um, uh, by including federal judges. And so the idea is, you know, do, do, do uh, federal judges take partisan or ideological uh, rationales uh, or, ba or their background into mind in, in, uh, in approving or disapproving of reapportionment um, maps uh, by state legislatures or drawing the maps um, uh, themselves. And I think it's, it's the, the evidence points in different directions, to, to paraphrase Michael Kang from her, um, um, earlier. It, it, it's, it's just, uh, it depends, you know, what data set you're looking at, and it's just hard to, uh, to, to say if the three-judge district court, you know, lessens or heightens partisan decision-making in, in this regard by, by federal judges. I, th I think there's evidence pointing both ways. Final thing is, what about the direct appeal? Uh, many of these three-judge district court decisions um, in reapportionment cases are, in fact, not all by any means, but many of them are directly appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, but many of those cases are summarily affirmed. They, they're there's not a full decision by the Supreme Court. They'll just summarily affirm in a one-line decision the, the, um, uh, the, the, um, the case below. That, that I think on Monday of this week, I think that, that occurred, a case from Mississippi, I, I believe. Uh, that very thing occurred, a summary um, uh, affirmance. So again, you know, uh, the, the, uh, 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 that, that and other evidence suggests to me that, that the direct appeal process, uh, you know, I could, it could cut different ways. So, uh, so I, I wish I had a, a grand slam uh, conclusion here, but uh, um, on the last point is, is, is that I'm, um, the, uh, I'm ambivalent about the effect of the three-judge district um, court uh, as an institution in these reapportionment cases, uh, as opposed to simply, you know, having the a case before a single district judge with normal appellate review um, thereafter. So, uh, 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 so the, the 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 last point is simply that you know these are not simply aspects of the original. Both these things I was talking about are not simply aspects of the original Baker case, although they certainly were, and I think played a role in, in the Baker litigation. But they're, you know, they, they, uh, they for good or ill, they affect um, reapportionment litigation and related electoral law litigation to the present day. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Ah, perfect. Um, I'm going to follow up. I, there's actually an interesting parallel to what um, we just heard, uh, in, because I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the census and the data issues underlying and the, uh, the reapportionment cases. I'm going to talk almost nothing about the cases themselves and a great deal about what happened afterwards um, and a little bit before. Um, but in particular, the law called Public Law 94-171, which was passed in December 1975, which lays out the guidelines for the data um, publication needs for that we now we've used ever since for uh, redistricting. Okay, so in order to start this, I'm going to just I'm also an historian, so you always you got to listen to the history. Um, the um, you know you got the founding fathers back there in 1787, as uh, we heard a little bit this morning. Um, sitting in the room uh, together, trying to figure out how to make this government go. And um, I always like to get their pictures in there so that um, we see what it was like. It was a very hot room. They, sat, they had the windows closed uh, all summer. And they came out with the 1787 Constitution that we uh, live with. The government had been going very badly, and the revolution was in, was in some jeopardy at this point, so that the, um, the the creativity of this instrument uh, is really rather remarkable, and in particular, this paragraph, um, which is from Article One, Section Two, Paragraph Three. I'm not going to talk about much about the Fourteenth Amendment, but this is the original apportionment clause. Um, 
uh, re which of course had you know, representatives in direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included in this union according to their respective numbers. And this was the debate in the, in the um, Constitutional Convention, which is how does one allocate both responsibility, namely taxation, and political power, namely representation, in uh, a democratic uh, a representative, it wasn't democratic yet, it was a representative assembly. And the decision was to use um, uh, the, the whole number of free persons, and of course what you see here is the three-fifths compromise plus the exclusion of Indians not taxed, and uh, the clarification that in what were indentured servants at the time that the people bound to service for a term of years were to be counted with the free persons. Um, and then the setup for the census uh, in the next sentence. Now, um, why is this important? Um, it turns out the US is the first country in the world to do this, uh, to allocate states in a national assembly according to population. And it was, and it, you add to that the demographic dynamism and diversity of the US population, and the two things together make the census and the statistical system and the apportionment mechanisms central to the functioning of the state. So I'm going to define a little bit about dynamism and diversity, uh, meaning patterns of growth and change, and diversity, meaning numerical, geographic, and racial and ethnic diversity. There are many others, but let me start with that. We've gone from 3.9 to 309. It's actually over 310 now. 13 states to 50, uh, 65 to 435 members of the House. Uh, the average, this is a wonderful statistic, the average congressional district after this census it will be larger than the total population of any of the original 13 states. So this has been an instrument designed in a, in a in, you know, several centuries ago that um, has actually managed, not terribly, not always happily, but it has managed to, uh, the, the enormous change in the American state over the last 200, and 200 odd years. And, uh, and it's done so while growth has been differential, whereas you know, some places win, some places lose, and that's of course why this, is, this process is so painful every decade. I'm gonna just sort of visualize this a little bit. This is the 2010 um, uh, population distribution map that's out. Um, I'll give you a little comparison of England and France, of course, from the constitutional perspective. Um, you can see those growth rates aren't very um, dramatic. There's the U.S. against it. So the, the, that upward swoop was the problem. Uh, through the 19th century, it was, much, it was almost 30 to 35 percent a decade of more people every decade. Um, and uh, since then, the population growth has gone down, uh, rate has gone down, but it's still substantial. There's the, the growth in the states of the Union. There's the size of the House um, as it has grown from two, for two centuries. And of course, this is just a quick example of the differential issue. Um, New York State, um, just as one very large state that has had a fairly um, consistent population growth pattern, nevertheless has seen, because of, the, of apportionment politics and, and relative growth uh, in other parts of the country, its, its congressional delega uh, delegation grow very rapidly, decline, grow again, decline again. Right? That is, for the, from a popular person's and, and your garden variety politician's perspective, this makes no sense. How can the one graph go up and the other go down? And that's every decade we have to relearn that because we all forget what we did, except for those of us in this room, that it, what it was like 10 years ago or 20 years ago. I often ask my students, where were you on April 1st, um, 2000? Or where were you on April 1st, um, 1990? As opposed to where were you on September 11th, 2001, right? You don't, we don't remember this process um, very much. This is the 2010 uh, allocation of uh, winners and losers. Uh, most of the losers are in the Northeast and Midwest. The, the winners are in the South and West. This, is a com this has been a pattern for a number of um, censuses of you know, the last 40 or 50 years. Geographic diversity. Americans figured out incredibly quickly how to manipulate these, um, the, the, you know, the, the system, if you will. This is the first gerrymander. It's 1812. It's the third census. They figure it out. Um, uh, the paper has other examples, including the fact that the first apportionment in 1792 generated the first congressional uh, presidential veto because over the over the ambiguities left in the in the apportionment clause about exactly how does one do this. Um, this is um, these are just again some maps of the geographic diversity. Um, the 
the expansion uh, over time. Uh, the little red dots are the center of population, showing the, the shift of the population westward. This is a kind of you know, uh, uh, ongoing process. And of course, racial and ethnic diversity, I'm, all, I'm giving you 2,000 here, but this is um, the proportion of the population that's white, the proportion of the population that's uh, African American, and the proportion that's uh, Hispanic Latino. And so you can see that, that from, the, from very large um, you know, visions, and I could of course scale these back down to you know, local areas as well, the, um, the problem therefore of drawing districts and dividing up the country is, uh, is, has to be managing this dynamism and diversity. Okay. The problem, as we heard this morning, with, uh, that leads to Baker v. Carr is the decision in 1920 to freeze the size of the House of Representatives um, and um, the inability, therefore, of Congress to use the mechanism they'd used for the previous 120 years, namely increasing the House size um, each decade to ease the absolute, um, the relative loss and absolute loss. Okay. So the, the corrupt bargain, as I'm calling it, of the 20s was to, uh, uh, to not reapportion. Uh, there's lots of wonderful history about, about this and what happened. The solution was to do the prospective reapportionment. By the way, the, the malapportionment was obvious immediately. It wasn't something that you had to wait till the 60s to discover. In, in the 30s, um, New York's congressional delegations varied by a factor of 7.8. In other words, seven, the largest district was 7.8 times as large as the smallest. So it was a, it was a problem immediately, and they knew it. Um, it it was off the political agenda um, and until the 60s. And what now I want to just describe now is the implementation. If you are going to reapportion on one person, one vote, and with accurate numbers, you need accurate data, small tabulations to build a, as building blocks. They need to be to deal with the, the question of political jurisdictions. They should be free and open public data, and they should need to be come out quickly. I, Turns out that the Census Bureau was completely flummoxed by this problem, and um, the, the gold standard that we now have is, is a sort of block level data, only existed for 60% of the country, 2% of the land area. Um, so the Census Bureau gave um, local um, legislatures, state legislatures, what was called the Master Enumeration District List, um, which was, uh, in the jargon of statistics, collection geography, not tabulation geography. And I start the paper with a wonderful quote about how uh, an absurd but fundamental incongruence exists in most states between census geography and political electoral geology, uh, geography. Okay. So the, after the, in the 70s, um, Congress takes up this issue with uh, national councils of state legislatures and other interest groups. They pass PL 94-171 in December 75 that, that um, amends Title 13 of the U.S. Code to give um, uh, that the Census Bureau would, set, and would set, lay out standards, the states would then uh, lay out their data needs, and that, the, the, that you would create a new system so that the data would then be ready on April 1st, the year after the census. By, in the 1980 round, 23 states participated. Um, the, if, they, if they did participate, they received block level tabulations and maps. Um, in the rest, if they didn't, and including parts of those 23 states, they still got the enumeration district data. The materials were at that point still paper, computer tape, and microfiche. The variables in the file were total population, five race groups, and Hispanic Latino. Um, this is the block, uh, the census blocking of the country in 1980. There's an awful lot of white space there. By 1990, that was all filled in. Um, and we went from having two million blocks to seven million blocks, um, and the in uh, and the Tiger Math system was developed by the Census Bureau. We had GIS come on the scene, and the um, and we added one um, variable, new variable to the PL files, what come to be called the PL files, namely the voting age population. All right. So let's ask again, you know, whether we're done. Basically, the, um, these are the five standards that I'm suggesting that you need. Um, by, the, by the 90s, the Bureau had done four of them. Small area um, election, pre small precincts, um, easy to use, and timely. And this data has 
comes out. This is what the census geography for 2000 looks like. And you'll notice what, what's most interesting about this is that the, the number of units um, of the categories, in other words, the reporting categories, so that the, there are now 8.2 million, um, um, a little over 8.2 million blocks that are used as building blocks for reporting the data for uh, redistricting. The average population size is 34. We have what is known as things called, if anybody does this, something called water blocks, which are um, blocks that are lakes and streams and rivers where uh, sometimes people live in those water blocks, maybe. Um, and I, I just, to give you an image of it, this is the, this is a data dump of the, from FactFinder for the, the, um, uh, block level data from the PL94171 file for Milwaukee, Wisconsin, my hometown, at um, uh, the city. And you'll notice where the red line is that um, this shows you how many rows there are in this table. Um, it goes obviously very deep down, but it also goes across. And there are, we see here rows 1 to 18 of 7,688 um, uh, blocks for the city of Milwaukee. So that's the raw data that put together that is used. And you'll see that the numbers in the table are quite small. Now, the problem is, therefore, that, that the block level tabulations are prone to error because of their small size. And it turns out that that also relates and resonates with another problem, which is the census undercount issue, uh, which was discovered at the same time um, as the, um, the reapportionment decisions, and in fact, um, is, is, is in some sense be, is politicized at, uh, because of the reapportionment decisions, namely that the census uh, counts um, the total population better than it counts uh, minority popula populations. And here you have the black versus total um, undercount data from, from 1940 to 2000. Um, the, the, these are data that the Census Bureau produces every decade. And the differential, of course, in, impacts on um, the redistricting process. So the question was, well, if this fix this, you know, correct it somehow. So the 70s and 80s, the Bureau spent a lot of time figuring out how to correct it, came up with a new methodology. Of, um, I can describe the, this in detail. Uh, post-enumeration, which is a sample survey using dual systems estimation. It turned out, of course, that, the, 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 that most politicians on both sides of the aisle took a look at this and said, either ooh goody or no way, Jose, right? Because in other words, it was an obvious partisan uh, implication of fixing the undercount, as opposed to doing the block level um, uh, tabulation, geographic tabulations. So the result is, is that um, cities and states sued the Commerce Department from the 70s to the 90s, most of, mostly it was Democratic jurisdictions suing Republican jurisdictions. Um, the final legal resolution was the, uh, was the Department of, House, of Commerce versus U.S. House in 1999, where the Supreme Court ruled that the, sense, the statute, not the constitutional, right, the statute, Title 13, prevented the use for of, of sampling, namely a, a post enumeration for apportioning and therefore adjusting the census, but it might permit it for, for redistricting or other estimates or other uses. Um, the census was not adjusted in 2000. Um, they, the Census Bureau could not show that, the accu that, that it would improve the accuracy at the, of the tabulations at the block level, um, namely the redistricting file. They also discovered, and as this research has gone on, um, that there are still errors in the census, uh, including gross errors. There's the 2000 uh, final estimate, 1.3 million people overcounted. Um, the differentials remain. Um, the block level data is error filled no matter what, you know, whether it's adjusted or not. Um, and the, the National Academy pa panel recommended that the census, uh, that the deadline for redistricting, which is April 1st of the year one, be moved back a little bit to improve the quality of the census data. That has not happened. Um, the 2010 evaluation program that was only done at the high levels of geography, um, there's no plan to allocate it any, any kind of error uh, estimates down to the low level of geography. And again, we come back and take a look at this, right? And so these evaluations will come out in 2012. Um, we won't know, in other words, whether the underlying data are, have serious problems until after the, after the redistricting round is done. And 
it remains to be seen whether that will lead to litigation later in the decade. Okay, this is my plug for um, the encyclopedia that details all of this. I have a copy and ads, and thank you. Good afternoon. I am trained as a social scientist and have become, and, and, and as an information scientist, uh, but what I'm, I'm presenting today will be uh, a, uh, a policy argument informed by both. Uh, the beginning. Uh, this is joint work with Michael McDonald, as, uh, as Margot said, two heads are, are more numerous than one. Uh, and it's supported by various uh, generous funders. Uh, there's a bunch of related work and warning. This presentation is for educational purposes only, may contain oversimplifications, errors, and or preliminary conclusions, caveat lector. So look at the published stuff if you want to cite it. Uh, this was the, the thing we were posed you know, a wide range of legal scholars and social scientists will address the many questions among these issues, our principles of districting, the nature of representation, voting rights, simple stuff. Uh, so all, all we need to do for redistricting, right, to, to, to get it absolutely right, is understand the question of what is the nature of representation. And so there's a simple answer, right? And the simple answer is this, uh, this is a story about a very senior political scientist and he's, he's world renowned, and he went, um, he traveled to Russia shortly after the fall of communism to lecture to the newly formed Duma. And after speaking, a newly minted member of the Duma approached him and asked him a question. Uh, I said, I've been elected as a representative. So when I vote, should I vote the way I think the electors want me to, or should I vote the way I think is right? It's a good question. Scholars have been studying this for 2,000 years. Let me just say there are many opinions. In the last 30 years, still many opinions, right? So what are, what are second best principles for redistricting? Pre-Baker, Baker versus Carr, um, outcome regulation. So we'll go through pre-Baker, Baker, 20th century, and what might the 21st century bring? Uh, Margot quoted the Constitution. We don't need to do that. Um, there are also uh, congressional legislation, legislation in each state, um, provisions on, on the frequency. Uh, that was, uh, and, the, and there are some observations. These are some nice New York districts uh, from various uh, early Congresses, um, displaying various sorts of non-contiguity. Um, here are patterns of malapportionment, following con contiguous boundaries, um, compactness, following whole counties, and observations, not in, uh, not, not in the law. You got all that? Yeah. So, but to summarize and oversimplify, uh, what was happening before Baker, at least through 1913 or so, was there was equal apportionment among states, uh, not so much within states, and, and often not so much within states by design, because Representation was based on a notion of place, whether it was a set, explicitly a set of counties or, or areas and people would, sometimes they had to be contiguous and sometimes they didn't. They could say these counties are like, you know, like each other. Well, we're gonna represent these places. Uh, single member districts were not required. They were multi-member at large. Uh, 
re redistricting was common, was predominant in theory, bans on re redistricting was predominant in theory for state legislatures, but not necessarily in practice, um, and, and certainly not enforced with regularity. Um, contiguity uh, was actually more common in, in uh, practice than in theory. And county boundaries, um, they, were com they, they were also more, uh, more common in, in, in practice than in theory. And, and, also, and as a result of that, districts were compact. Uh, in, because counties were compact and, and districts were made out of counties. It was uncommon that there were explicit, uh, less common that there were explicit uh, compactness requirements and what seems to be driving the compactness was almost always the counties. So what was the problem? Well, to some extent, non-enforcement. By the, by the time Baker versus Carr was decided, there were unprecedented levels of malapportionment, especially at the, the, legisl the state legislative level. Uh, there's, there had always been racial gerrymandering pretty much at will. There were use of electoral boundary change or lack thereof to maintain large amounts of partisan bias. Uh, so Baker versus Carr introduced enforced process restrictions. And the idea in this typology is that you remove some discretion from the, from the redistricting authority and you have some criteria you evaluate ex ante. It's not based on what happens in those districts, what you're predicting. Uh, and Baker versus Carr was about equal population, but there are also hundreds of compactness variants. You can, you can apply process restrictions for natural, administrative, media market boundaries, for contiguity in various sorts. Um, but what's the problem with, uh, with process-based restrictions? So two, actually. One is that they're weak. And the second is that face neutrality is, is, does not have much to do with outcome neutrality. So there's a generally a weak empirical link between these various process neutrality and outcomes. Uh, certainly, the population restriction has not prevented gerrymanders, uh, though it has reduced the ability to uh, uh, some of the some of the worst malapportionment. Uh, so, um, and there were unintended consequences uh, when you look at the patterns of following the traditional districting principles after Baker versus Carr, you see counties being split, less compact districts, lack of contiguity or point contiguity. The, the other principles that were in play pretty much went out the window. Um, and there, there can be uh, intended second order consequences uh, of generally of process-based restrictions. Uh, Parker uh, illustrates a, a intended uh, combination of neutral rules. After the equal population deci decision, Hines County needed to be um, redistricted into uh, equal population districts. And so they chose neutral criteria in addition to uh, equal population. Neutral criteria being uh, well, contiguity, equal area because uh, the county commissions are sort of responsible for management and of, of roughly proportional area and equal road mileage because county commissioners are responsible for roads. And you put them all together and you, you sort of have to take slices of the central urban area which just happens to have all the minorities in it and combine them with large urban areas which happen to have all the, uh, uh, all the roads. So the population plus these other neutral criteria create a uh, racial journey. And there are more general results we've shown in other work that compactness rules can have predictable partisan effects based because of the interaction with uh, electoral geography. The support for both parties is not geographically distributed in the same way. So another line of, of control were outcome restrictions. We haven't talked about, we, Gomelian was brought up once, but that was a, that, that preceded Baker. And it was not based on process. It was based on the fact that bleaching Tuskegee 
violated the 14th and 15th Amendment rights of, of uh, black citizens. So it was the outcome that was the problem. And this line of cases was followed to where it lays rest and, and embodied in the Voting Rights Act. But you know, what, what's the problem with outcome restrictions? Well, uh, it, there, there's a lot of indeterminacy. Um, many, many different outcome restrictions are imposed. Uh, and although we can reach some agreement on some sorts of things we don't like and how to measure them, um, at least provisionally, like racial gerrymandering in the Voting right, Rights Act, um, in order to, to reach agreement on which criteria, outcome criteria to use, we have to go back to that representation problem and solve that. So you can't have it all at once. And so what other principles can come into play. Um, institution seeking method, regulation, open institutions. Uh, and in the, the, the 20th century, there were, uh, there's, there's been a trend around separation of expert and political decisions, uh, sunshine, freedom of information, open hearings, where you can throw comment periods. Um, and Examples of applying this to redistricting include restricting the types of information that can go into the redistricting process, requiring public hearings, requiring an independent commission structure. So what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is that although this works in uh, some other uh, modern democracies, like the UK and Canada and Australia and New Zealand, which have reasonably nonpartisan uh, redistricting commissions, um, many US independent nonpartisan commissions aren't. They're either ex ante or bipartisan because of the way that they, uh, they're constituted, or they're ex ante non-independent, or they're just weakly resistant to, uh, to all sorts of ex ante and ex post pressure. And many public hearings on redistricting are theater. You know, they, don't, they don't change the plans adopted, and they're not designed to produce evidence that can be used by courts later. Uh, though you can get public input about what you'd like, but if it doesn't materialize into, into a set of uh, viable alternatives, it doesn't give the court much to do. Um, and, and still, although much you know, voting records, for example, are public, uh, you have to do a lot of work to get voting data and combine it with, uh, and combine it with census data. And there have been some major project Mike will talk about a little bit. And, uh, and otherwise, um, you can go to each of the county registrar's offices and, and get the data. It's public, but it, there's still a barrier. Uh, so what are possible 21st century principles? Um, well, transparency, integrating technology to support institutions, to support transparency and participation institutions. Uh, so transparency at internet speed, which means making the data available on the web so that we can actually use it. Open data in open formats, uh, about everything that, that needs, uh, that that you need to create and reproduce and evaluate the redistricting plan, uh, having an open process, and where redistricting software and other sorts of electoral software is involved, open source, so that the, me so that, that the, the software doesn't become a black box that's manipulatable. Uh, participation, technology gives the uh, opportunity for more direct access to the process. If there's access to tools, then it is possible for citizens to engage in the redistricting process. And this ha results not only in more participation in terms of engagement, but in terms of the information. You can start to have people identify where their communities of interest are, where they think their neighborhoods are. Um, we have been uh, working in this area, and uh, Mike will tell you about District Builder, but we've had multiple district competitions, hundreds of plans generated, thousands of participants, and millions of viewers. <laughs> um, 
So stay tuned, uh, and I will cede my, uh, the, the rest of my time to the gentleman from Mississippi. <laughs> Thank you, Micah. Uh, so my name's Michael. I'm a recovering gerrymanderer. <laughs> I've been involved in redistricting in uh, too many states now. I've lost count. I, I, uh, getting uh, just wrapped up in this round of redistricting is, uh, is overtaking me now. Um, but uh, through that experience, I think I'm one of the few people in this room who's actually drawn districts and presented them to irate members of a legislature. Um, who were very upset about you know, their mother being drawn out of their district or their country club um, or their favorite donor or um, having an incumbent of a, another party in their district or a potential challenger down the road in their district or a community that they didn't like in their district or a community that they wanted in their district but wasn't in their district. So um, uh, all of those things um, uh, are the, the sorts of things that happen during redistricting uh, on the inside. And what uh, Micah and I, I, I believe, share are um, uh, an interest in uh, having redistricting not necessarily represent the interests and needs of the um, public, I mean, of, of the politicians who are drawing the districts or their consultants, uh, but more of the public. And so that gets us to um, our project which is uh, publicmapping.org, and hopefully we get internet. Yes, we do. So um, uh, the public mapping project is uh, an idea that really originated, um, I have to give a lot of credit to Micah for um, uh, developing, uh, with modest help by myself, uh, an open source redistricting package called BARD for the R programming language, and I know a lot of you lawyers are just crossing your eyes when I start talking about software packages. But, um, uh, uh, and, and we had worked on this, and I think uh, and we had this idea that we could create automated redistricting, and we discovered, like many other people before us, that automated redistricting is very, very difficult, um, and uh, in most circumstances won't even produce a viable solution, especially if you have multi-criteria that you have to adhere to. Um, but um, at an American Mathematical Association meeting, uh, we ran into a mathematician who also is a program director at Sloan Foundation, um, Danny Goroff, who also shared this vision of getting the uh, public more involved within, uh, in redistricting. And uh, we had a conversation with him about how to take this um, software that we had written that had some very rude, crude, sort of rudimentary um, uh, 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 mapping um, uh, capabilities onto it and really ramp it up to be something that uh, could be used uh, more broadly uh, um, by the public. And um, so the Sloan Foundation, the Joyce Foundation, uh, the, um, the uh, Mary uh, Judy, the Ju Judy Ford Wason Center for Public um, uh, uh, Policy at Christopher Newport University and um, Amazon have all contributed uh, uh, monetarily uh, in one way or another to this project, which Micah and I are principal investigators on, and uh, our software development partner uh, has been uh, Azavia, which is a Philadelphia-based GIS firm, and we've been working very closely with uh, state-based uh, groups throughout the country. Uh, earlier, Mark Salling had mentioned the Midwest Democracy Network, so we've been involved with um, that organization, which is primarily um, supported by the Joyce Foundation uh, in deploying the software in Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Minnesota to support state and local redistricting. And we've um, also been engaged in other states uh, with redistricting competitions, and we had one in Ohio, which Mark described. Um, we've had one in Michigan. We're having one right now that uh, wrapped up in Minnesota. Uh, we, uh, our very first one was in Virginia. Uh, we had one in Arizona, one in the city of Philadelphia, and currently underway is a redistricting competition in um, the state of New York. And um, uh, so through the software that we've developed, which is a web browser solution, 
Um, and you can get more information here at the, at the Public Mapping Project and a link to the, the New York software. I won't, it, we probably don't have time, so I won't actually demo it, but you can actually go online right now. Um, it's open to the public. You just have to uh, create a username and password, uh, redistrictny.org. There's also a, a link on this website here. Um, and uh, you can start drawing districts for the state of New York. Um, and you're doing it through your web browser. This, the program's completely open source, and uh, which again, it goes back to the principles of transparency that we believe very strongly in uh, if we're going to apply that to uh, institutions that are uh, drawing district lines, we believe that it should apply to ourselves as well. So open source, the data we also document, um, and it's uh, publicly available on the on public mapping uh, website as well, disaggregated election data down at the block level, which is what you need in order to evaluate the different effects of, of different redistricting plans. Now we've l learned a lot um, in this effort. Uh, um, it's uh, uh, we first we've been engaging the public and, and primarily students, but also others uh, in these redistricting competitions. And we've educated students about the issues of, uh, of redistricting and the trade-offs that are involved between different criteria, educating people about uh, what the Voting Rights Act is and what those requirements are and uh, what, are, what are the consequences uh, for uh, um, opportunities of, of drawing districts um, elsewhere within a state or a locality. Uh, and as a consequence of, of educating these, um, particularly students, again, in these competitions, um, we discovered uh, quite by chance, uh, or maybe by design, lucky design, that the media really latched onto this story, too. Because we had taken a dry process story about redistricting and made a human interest element, which was a contest with prizes. And uh, we've had really wonderful media coverage about these contests in Virginia, um, uh, over 30 local media um, um, uh, stories and uh, in newspapers, uh, radio coverage, television coverage. Uh, our best uh, um, story to date uh, nationally would be, and USA Today did a feature uh, on what we were doing uh, in Virginia. Um, so as a byproduct of educating these students through these competitions, we've also educated the public about the importance of redistricting and some of the trade-offs are involved because the media have been able to uh, take a story that um, is difficult for them to cover and put a new face on it and cover it in a different way. So um, we've had a lot of success about educating the public. Um, and we've also had success at educating policymakers about redistricting um, opportunities. Uh, some people, when we first um, started this uh, project, didn't think that the public could draw a legal redistricting plan. Um, we've proven that to be wrong. Um, students have drawn uh, legal redistricting plans. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the second place congressional finisher in Michigan was a 10-year-old. And uh, many of the editorial pages thought that he did a better job than what the state legislature did in terms of redistricting. <laughs> So it's, if it's as simple as a 10-year-old can do it, um, uh, it tells you that uh, um, it is very difficult. I mean, I, don't get me wrong, redistricting is very complex, and if you get in and start uh, working with the software and drilling down to the census block level, as Margo um, probably knows very well about, um, and you get into road medians, which are census blocks, and oh boy, and, and you, you draw districts and you'll lose those things as you're drawing the districts. It, um, it's very tedious, um, to say the least, uh, when you're drawing districts. Um, but it's possible that, that people can do this. And uh, we've had um, students uh, in Virginia in particular um, uh, draw districts that informed the governor's independent um, uh, bipartisan advisory redistricting com commission. Um, now, they were doing that because I was working as a consultant for the governor's office on the commission, uh, and so I was taking the plans that the students were developing, and I was presenting some of those plans that I thought were interesting ideas uh, to that commission. And some of the plans that we eventually adopted were plans that the commission, uh, that the students actually were ideas that the students uh, came up with. So we had a very direct link there, and of course I was the bridge for it. Um, uh, so maybe you discount it. Uh, and of course, the governor issued a veto of the first uh, state legislative plans in Virginia, um, and he did cite um, the commission's work 
in, uh, in that veto, but the subsequent plans that he did assign weren't all that different than the first round which the legislature did, which did ignore somewhat what the students were doing, but not all, all of what the students were doing. For example, a team from the University of Virginia uh, drew a redistricting um, plan that had six state Senate districts that were majority African American. And currently there's only five. And I talked with the uh, Department of Justice, I talked with the, uh, um, the state uh, consultants who were um, drawing those plans, um, and they were very interested in that sixth uh, Senate district because they thought there was a viable um, uh, voting rights issue uh, because they could draw that sixth um, black voting age population majority district. Um, as it turned out, people did some additional um, analyses of that district and determined that it would not be an effective district because it was just a bare majority district. And so the um, state Senate did not draw that district, but they did look at it very seriously. Um, and more importantly was a district that the um, William and Mary Law School team developed, uh, which showed how to draw uh, African American influenced congressional district in the southeastern part of um, Virginia. And uh, that particular district now, or at least the concept that's embodied in it, has become the sticking point in negotiations between uh, the Republican controlled House of Delegates and the Democratic controlled um, Senate. And we don't have a congressional redistricting plan in the state of uh, Virginia. It may be that the plan um, that will eventually be uh, um, drawn by a special master, and in that case, um, maybe that special master will look favorably upon some of these ideas like the one um, the, the uh, William and Mary Law School team came up with. Um, so we've had these real successes. Um, in Minnesota, they also have a divided state government, and uh, in that state, a uh, state Supreme Court has uh, taken up the ball to um, uh, uh, draw a redistricting plan. And knowing that we have the software um, uh, working in Minnesota, the um, state Supreme Court has uh, um, worked with Common Cause to make sure that uh, uh, plans that we draw with the redistricting uh, software uh, we've deployed there uh, will be considered by the state Supreme Court. Uh, so there we have a very direct input into the process. We had a very direct input into Arizona as well, um, but that commission was working mo more on, it, on its own than, um, than taking some of the input from what we were doing. Um, and then lastly, we're in New York at the moment, and so it's possible that uh, uh, we're, that com co uh, competition is underway at the moment, and it's possible that the governor, who said that he would veto um, uh, plans uh, in the state of New York, uh, may look favorably upon some of the, the student-drawn plans in that competition, um, or we may up, again end up in a, um, uh, in a special master situation uh, if, um, if there's no agreement between the governor and the legislature uh, on maps. And so, again, we could see a special master in that circumstance um, look favorably upon what the public is doing. So um, we theoretically, you know, as, as academics, we had this idea that public participation um, in redistricting could be good um, or at least produce different outcomes. And we've actually achieved that in some ways, and we've achieved other goals about educating the public about uh, redistricting. Um, and uh, for our own academic interest, we're, we're, we're collecting these plans, as, as uh, Micah mentioned. We're collecting plans, by the way. I, I wish we could take credit for some of the other things that are going on out there, but <laughs> in Dallas, there was a local redistricting that a librarian um, drew the, the plan for the city of Dallas. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's other software available out there, and ours isn't the only one um, uh, that enable people to draw redistricting plans. Um, so we're collecting those as well. So everywhere there's public uh, mapping that's going on, we're collecting up the plans. And one of the things that we're um, doing is, as Micah has laid out, they're all, and, and what we've been discussing today quite a bit, frankly, in the wake of Baker, is that um, equal population um, in some ways uh, uh, voided out some of the state constitutional requirements 
on uh, respecting political boundaries, compactness, et cetera, uh, because those had to be subordinate to the equal population standard. And as we're getting plans developed and, and drawn, um, we're able to start mapping out the trade-offs between different criteria. Um, we could see what the cri difference of, of relaxing or, or restricting that population um, uh, deviation is on other criteria as we um, uh, see uh, plans that are being developed, which is something that we haven't been able to do before, really, as academics. And I would suggest that most of the academic literature on, and scholarship on redistricting is fatally flawed because um, we are selecting on our dependent variable. We are selecting on the plans that have been developed through the political process that embody the political goals. And we don't really set up the proper counterfactual, which is what would happen in, uh, if other things were happening, um, if we were following a different set of criteria. And so by getting these maps together, we're able to um, start fleshing out what those alternative hypotheses or, or those counterfactuals may actually look like and give us a better sense about um, what is the effect of a compactness requirement on uh, political fairness or some other value that we may care about and, um, and see uh, in, a, in a better way, in a more academic way, um, uh, what, uh, what the reform efforts um, to, like in Arizona and California, other places, um, what could be achieved um, uh, in, in various uh, political settings across the country. So um, we, we've had pretty good success um, and we're hoping, uh, you know, we're, of course we wanted to educate the public about this whole process and educate public uh, policymakers, which we've achieved those goals. And we'll see now if, uh, if we might be able to educate academia as well, coming back with some of the, the data that we're generating from our project. So thank you very much. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you to the Law Review editors for the invitation, but I, I really do want to thank you for being here. When, when I was a student here, I think to get a crowd like this at 4 o'clock on a Friday, we would have had to hold the event at the Barking Spider. Um, and, you know, as John mentioned, I'm, I'm an alumnus. I'm, I'm also from Cleveland, and so I've been having waves of nostalgia since, <laughs> since coming in last night. And I, I've been struck really by two platitudes. One is you can't go home again because you know, nothing is the same as when I was here before. My whole family has moved away, so I had to stay at the hotel like everyone else who's not from here last night. And then coming to the law school, not one of the eight professors I had in my first year still teaches here. So it's a very different institution. I found out to my never-ending chagrin at dinner last night that you no longer play the Law Review moot court football game. This is terrible. Um, you know, it's just, it's not the same institution. Uh, the, the other thing I've been struck, the other platitude that struck me is that home is where the heart is. And despite all the changes from the time I left, my heart is still here, and it's still here in no small part because John is still here, who is a great teacher, and you will carry that, him and your other great teachers with you through your legal careers and whatever it is you end up doing. So I want to thank John not just for being a great teacher, but for being a great mentor and for many kindnesses and much generosity from the years in between. Um, but oh, go ahead, he deserves it. <laughs> But you didn't invite me here to reminisce, so I will put that aside and try to earn my supper, which was very good last night. Thank you <laughs> for that. Um, and I want to talk about uh, the topic for this panel, which I, I'm really interested in, and that is Baker's legacy for the institutions, and especially the institution of the court, but the other branches as well. But I'd like to talk about it, if you will indulge me, outside the box of reapportionment. Um, so I want first, to me, the most interesting um, opinion in Baker is Justice Frankfurter's dissent, right, which reprises his warning from Colgrave, Colgrove versus Green about the court getting into the political thicket, his warning that getting into these cases was inappropriate for the judicial role. Um, I think the relevant precedent, though, for, for really considering Baker 
isn't Colgrove versus Green or any of the other reapportionment cases, it's one that will be familiar to all the students in the room, unless you're first years, um, Erie Railroad versus Tompkins, hmm. right? Because in Erie, the court articulated a restrained view of the judicial role, right? That's what Erie is all about, is the judiciary won't be making, in the business of making law anymore. It should have a very constrained role. It shouldn't be out there doing that kind of thing. Um, Baker is itself not primarily about election law, right? It's primarily about the political questions doctrine and the division of power between the court on the one hand and the political branches on the other. Um, and so really Baker, like any other political questions case, concerns separation of powers rather than reapportionment or election law. Um, and the reason I say that Erie then is the relevant context is its view of the judicial role within the separation of powers. Now, Justice Frankfurter was, of course, a leading champion of the Erie decision, right, um, and decided a number, wrote uh, some of Erie's most important <coughs> progeny. Um, and it's, I think, not at all a coincidence that in his dissent in Baker versus Carr, he quotes the brooding omnipresence language that he had used in one of the Erie cases, Reagan versus Merchant um, Warehouse, um, because to him, it's the same issue, right? This case actually turns out to be Justice Frankfurter's swan song. It's the second to last opinion he wrote, and it's the last major opinion that he wrote, and it's a warning to the court to adhere to the role that was articulated in Erie and not go down the road that Justice Brennan is articulating for the majority in this case, right? But of course, Justice Brennan did write for, for the court in Baker and his view was very different from the Erie view. His view is that the court has an important role, a robust role, in articulating, in fashioning, and protecting constitutional norms. Okay, so those are sort of the competing views. Now, Justice Frankfurter's view, I think, is on its own terms a bit naive. That is, Justice Frankfurter didn't recognize what I think was perhaps an even thicker political thicket. Right. The political questions doctrine that Justice Frankfurter wanted to decide the case on the basis of is itself a political thicket. What is a political question? What isn't a political question? That itself involves a very delicate political determination. Okay? And so even if, just, even if the court had followed Justice Frankfurter's advice, it would have been making itself a potentially very contentious political judgment. Um, and to illustrate the nature of that sort of judgment, I think it's helpful to talk a bit about the political questions case that the court is going to hear on Monday, MBZ versus Clinton. That case involves a statute wherein Congress has given individuals a right, okay? And the right is that if you're, if you're a citizen abroad and you, you have a child born in Jerusalem, Israel, then you have a right to have the foreign birth certificate designate that your child was born in Jerusalem, Israel. Foreign policy has for some years dictated that the foreign birth certificate would simply say Jerusalem without mentioning what country so that the United States can stay sort of neutral, agnostic on the question of Jerusalem status right, within the, the greater sort of Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Um, so Congress passed this statute giving individuals a right um, to determine whether or not their foreign birth certificate for their children would designate Jerusalem Israel and further specified that no money might be spent to issue any other um, foreign birth certificate. Okay. The case then raises several questions. One is, who has the recognition power? Does the president have exclusive recognition power? Another is, if the president has exclusive recognition power, does that extend to recognizing the territory of sovereigns or just who is the sovereign? Right. And then, if the president has the recognition power, including 
power to make determinations about territory, does Congress's authority to regulate naturalization and to attach riders to its appropriations justify its regulation with respect to foreign birth certificates? The DC Circuit in deciding this case said the case pre presented a political question. The DC Circuit is certainly wrong about that, right? The question of whether to recognize that Jerusalem is or is not within Israel is a political question. That's not the question posed in the case. The question posed in the case is which branch of government gets to make that decision, which is itself a matter of constitutional interpretation, a legal question, not a political question. Okay? And I, I think it's pretty clear that the Supreme Court took the case in order to reverse the DC circuit on that point, say it's not a political question, right? And then further, for whatever it's worth, um, to say that the president has recognition power and Congress's law is unconstitutional. Um, but to me, what's salient about that, about MBZ versus Clinton, is what the district court did with the case, because I think it reflects the, the reflexes, the instincts of judges that questions relating to military and foreign affairs are political questions that the courts shouldn't get involved in answering. And they will then reach for the political questions doctrine, even in cases like MBZ versus Clinton, where the political questions doctrine really isn't implicated. And I think this is pernicious, especially as it applies to war powers, okay? And now, Questions of war powers, like the question involved in MBZ versus Clinton, they can involve political questions. So the, the question of whether we should go to war with Iran or whether we should go to war with Libya, those are political questions. The court has no business answering that question. But other questions relating to the war power, the allocation of war power between the president and Congress, that's a legal question. Right? Does the president have to receive a declaration or some other authorization before launching a war? Right? That's a legal question. Right? And some recent administrations have taken a view different from the standard view that an authorization is required. Right? That's a legal question, not a political question. Um, the consequence of the judiciary's reluctance to consider these legal questions relating to the president's war power is that they're following the eerie Frankfurter approach to the judicial role rather than the role that Baker versus Carr sketched out for the judiciary. And that's, I think, pernicious because of recent developments, right? The immediate consequence of that is that the executive branch is left to its own devices to interpret its it's war powers, right? Because who's going to second guess them? And that's pernicious because of developments over the last approximately 10 years, right? First in the Bush administration, we had the notorious torture memo. We had a lesser noted but equally controversial opinion or contestable opinion um, taking the position that the president could launch a war without any authorization from Congress in advance. Okay, that's not the standard model view. It's not the traditional view even of the executive branch. Now you might say, well, we can cabin those opinions because that's just one administration that was sort of viewing its power as being on steroids in part because of the, the context of the situation post 9-11. <clears throat> and in fact, even the Bush administration itself eventually withdrew those opinions. Okay? But I think that argument is no longer available because of the legal interpretations of the Obama administration, the frankly scandalous legal interpretations of the Obama administration with respect to the war in Libya, right? And let's call it what it is, right? So there are two um, legal interpretations from the Obama administration that are particularly problematic, right? First was the, the um, opinion of the Office of Legal Counsel that the president could order um, the use of military force, 
right, to enforce a no-fly zone in Libya without receiving advance approval from Congress. And you read through that opinion and it is broad beyond anything that precedents from the executive branch would authorize, right? The typical view is that the president may order the use of force abroad that's short of war. If vital U.S. interests are at stake, and those vital U.S. interests have to be a threat to U.S. persons, right? Lives or grave injury, a threat to U.S. property, or a threat to the territory of the United States. And overwhelmingly, that's what has justified uses of force abroad short of war based on the president's own unilateral authority without an advance authorization from Congress. None of those justifications was present in the Libya situation. That's not to say it was wrong to go into Libya, that Congress shouldn't have authorized the president to do it, but the president needed some advance authorization from Congress. Okay. That position, that's my position, that's contestable. Right? I will concede that. But then the War Powers Resolution required that within 60 days the president cease hostilities unless the president first received authorization from Congress, which the president did not receive. Okay, this is less controversy, although I can't say there aren't people who stand up for the administration. Right, the administration took the view that the War Powers Resolution did not apply to our involvement in Libya because, I don't know how you can say this, but it, it, our involvement in Libya was not hostilities. Right? Bombing another country, evidently, is not hostilities if you do it with a drone. Um, what's particularly scandalous about that opinion is that it wasn't issued by the office in the Justice Department, the Office of Legal Counsel, that's supposed to issue those kinds of opinions. And the reason it wasn't issued by the Office of Legal Counsel is that the Office of Legal Counsel knew that what we were doing represented hostilities within the meaning of the War Powers Resolution. So what did the president do? He shopped around among the lawyers in the executive branch, right? The Defense Department said, no, this is hostilities within the War Powers Resolution. But over in the State Department, the legal advisor, Harold Coe, was only too happy to provide a legal justification for our involvement in Libya and to say, no, these were not hostilities, and the War Powers Resolution does not apply. Therefore, we don't have to stop um, and comply with the War Powers Resolution. This then is a legacy of Baker in the following sense. If the courts were willing to hear these kinds of cases, it would be very difficult, in fact, I think practically impossible for the president to simply shop within the administration for the legal fig leaf the president seeks to do whatever it is he wants to do, right? So in other words, in order really to promote rule of law values, it would be salutary to have judicial review available, not because of what the judiciary would say, but because of the way it would improve the internal executive branch legal interpretations. Right? And this is something I think Congress could easily provide for. Right? The courts currently have this reflex, this instinct, to avoid questions about military and foreign affairs wherever they can. Okay? But if there were a statute, that clearly required the court to exercise its jurisdiction, then I think the court couldn't avoid it, right? So the War Powers Resolution is on the books, but how does it get enforced, right? Congress would need to provide someone with standing. I'm happy to talk about that during the Q&A period. I think that's, that can be easily done. Um, and then the other question would be whether or not what constitutes hostilities is a political question. And I don't think it is, and I hope in fact, I expect that one consequence of the case argued on Monday is that that will be all the clearer. Although we shouldn't need that case if we just look at Baker versus Carr itself, Justice Brennan recognizes that in fact, 
questions of military and foreign affairs are not so frequently political questions as courts tend to imagine, right? That's, in fact, the first category of cases he talks about. Okay, if you go back and look at our legal history, the Supreme Court decided a number of cases relating to the quasi-war with France and didn't regard any of those cases as, pol as presenting political questions. In fact, in Little versus Barim, in Bass versus Tingey, in Talbot versus Seaman, the Supreme Court construed the scope of the president's power under authorizations from Congress and held that certain actions authorized by the president were beyond that scope. So clearly the court has not regarded those kinds of questions as political questions, and it would benefit the republic greatly if they would return to that position. Thank you. Well, we have covered an enormous amount of ground uh, in this session, um, and I want to uh, invite questions or comments from folks. Again, let's come on down to the mic so that we can get picked up. Hi, thank you for that. Um, as someone who's working in the midst of state apportionment still going on and congressional districting here in Ohio, the most important state in the country, um, I am interested in some predictions, if you're willing to provide them. Um, I'm wondering specifically how the huge improvements in technology and um, the speed with which we can draw maps will perhaps decrease court's deference to legislative bodies um, as litigation works its way through. Um, and secondly, does the perception that this process was handed back to the public um, further, you know, decreased deference to legislative bodies because I don't think the legislature, at least here in Ohio, perceived that the process was handed back to the public. They held on to it very firmly. But if you could comment on that, I'd appreciate it. Well, we did, uh, for a previous uh, paper, look at the uh, incidence of court-ordered plans versus special master plans, and you can see an increase uh, in the special master approach by the court starting in the 1990s. And so um, it, that seems to be um, concurrent with the adoption of technology that would allow the courts to draw their own plans, so, which makes a lot of sense, that prior to that time, the courts didn't have the capability of um, hiring a special master that could actually execute uh, and draw their own plans. So um, certainly the technology has enabled courts uh, to um, take the lead in, in drawing plans instead of selecting among those that were uh, produced during the legislative process. It's one reason why um, uh, political parties and incumbents are so fearful of the courts now because uh, those the plans that are produced by the courts may be dramatically different and not embody any of the um, sort of goals that the, the um, um, politicians may um, seek. Um, so, do you want to handle the other one? Well, I'll, I'll have two comments on the first and one on the second. As, as Michael mentioned in his talk, uh, the, uh, in Minnesota, publicly drawn plans have been accepted for the first time. So that's an indication that, um, that the, there's, the courts are, are paying attention to this. Um, it's hard to predict what will happen in the future, but given some of the, um, uh, some of the previous cases in which plans were, were compared to each other, and you know, parties often say, well, we would have liked to do X, Y, and Z, but we couldn't. You know, we, we did, this was as, as, as competitive as we could make it while holding with these other criteria and lacking evidence to the contrary, the courts will certainly defer to that. However, when there are a hundred or a thousand plans to choose from that are drawn to legal criteria, we're put in the public record prior to the adoption of the, the plan and, and would show that you, there, there are actually a different sort of trade-offs available, that sort of argument is closed off. Um, 
not other sorts of deferential arguments, but the, but the argument that there were no other possibilities was closed off, which you often see. Uh, as far as it being handed off to the public, it's not. There's a whole ladder of participation <coughs> going from people being interested in things to, to commenting and then to, to uh, trying to put pressure in and to, to proposing alternative solutions to consultative government. We're not, we're not nearly a consultative government yet, but we, we have offered people the ability to, to both comment in a more systematic way and to propose viable alternatives, which is increasing amounts of participation. Thank you. I was just thinking with Candace's um, comment about the judge who made the kind of silly comment about hackers not wanting to go after elections because they're not valuable. I was wondering if, you know, you thought judges would be similarly, mm -hmm. what is it, retro <laughs> in their views. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Neil. Um, I, I was hoping you would. <laughs> Toward the end of, 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 of your talk, you said that you thought that one of uh, the legacies of Baker was uh, Obama's ability or any president's ability to shop around and get whatever the claims they wanted to get, no matter how ludicrous the, the, the proposition was legal. And I was wondering whether you think, or could you flesh out a little bit, whether you think that that is a, a legacy of a problem in the way Brandon wrote the part of the opinion on the political question doctrine, or is it the result of a misinterpretation, an unjustified misinterpretation of Brennan's uh, opinion in Baker versus Connor? Right. So uh, that is a friendly question. Thank you. I misspoke. What I meant to say was that it's a legacy of Frankfurter's view in in um, in Baker versus Carr that judges shouldn't intervene. And I think it's a failure of judges in the interim to sort of take seriously what Justice Brennan, I think, correctly observed in that portion of the opinion that, in fact, questions about military and foreign affairs are not so thoroughly political questions as is typically assumed. Uh, thank you, and appreciate the presentations of each of you. Um, Neil, and, and on that point, I guess part of uh, what I was gathering from your presentation was that the court should play a role in some of the more uh, political questions, like you mentioned the Libya, um, I don't know if I agree with the word war, but the military action. And I guess what, what do you see as the practical application of that, in other words, if there is a conflict between president and the Congress where perhaps the president misused the power of the war powers resolution, why not just allow Congress to use its natural check in the form of the purse strings of the government as opposed to <coughs> intervening, having, having the courts intervene, whether it's some hybrid temporary restraining order after the commencement of a military action, why not simply allow the natural political uh, question to take place in the form of congressional uh, withholding of appropriations for uh, military action? Mm -hmm. um, because that doesn't work. It, it hasn't worked. The framers knew that wouldn't work either. That's why they limited appropriations for the military to two years so they would expire. But it, the president can find money to do this. Right, so Congress didn't appropriate money to go and enforce a no-fly zone in Libya. That money is in the Defense Department budget. Once we start a military operation, it's virtually impossible as a practical matter to defund it. Right? So if there's going to be an effective constraint, it's not likely going to come from pulling the purse strings. Right. And in fact, the Constitution doesn't limit Congress to the purse strings. Congress has a long list of military powers, not just the power to declare war, but the power to provide rules and regulations for the land and naval forces, to raise and support armies, to identify and provide for um, 
um, violations of the law of nations, and it goes on and on, the list of congressional war powers. So Congress isn't limited to just using the appropriations power, it can directly regulate what is done in the context of a war, as long as it doesn't go so far as to violate the president's commander in chief power, and that's often controversial, right? But Congress has, has affirmative regulatory powers. It's much more effective and efficient for Congress, and in fact viable, for Congress to use those powers to limit the president as, as commander in chief. And in fact, the Constitution's design appears to be one that assumes that that's what they will do, right? Not to just rely on using the spending power to limit the president. I, I, I see your point, but it seems to me that in all the other contexts and some of the presentations we heard today, it seems like the courts have taken the reactive role when it comes to redistricting, when it comes to a host of other issues and in this instance, I hear your argument to say the court should be proactive, almost in a, a, a policy-making role, in that while Congress has these other options available, maybe not simply the purse strings, but the other options it would have available simply may not be politically viable at the time. But the courts, in how you have suggested, would be letting Congress off the hook of maybe less politically viable options by invoking itself into some, whether it's a political issue or whether it's a foreign policy mm -hmm. issue. But right. it's a, it doesn't seem like from a practical standpoint, we would want the Supreme Court or even you know, a district court, whether it's from the DC circuit or wherever, wherever it would come out of, make certain decisions that preempt what the presidential powers are seems like the after the fact, the re more reactive role that the courts have taken would be the, the proper role. Right, and, that, and in your, that's in what I'm... The, you know, the scandalous, right, the scandalous example that you... Right, and so the court's role would be reactive, right? Someone has to go to court and that would happen presumably after hostilities have occurred for nine for 60 days right if there were an enforcement mechanism for the war powers resolution the judiciary would get involved in that at that point the proactive consequence of judicial involvement doesn't itself flow directly from the judiciary the fact that the judiciary could get involved later will mean that before the president acts the president and the president's legal advisors are going to have to take the demands of law very seriously. So the president doesn't, or doesn't announce that what we're doing in Libya isn't hostilities because he knows that if that goes into court, right, he's going to be made to look like a fool. We'll, we'll agree to disagree. <laughs> okay. But I appreciate your comment. Okay. I have a comment and also a question, mostly directed at, uh, at Margo, but I'm, I know that, um, that Michael and, and Mika also have a lot of expertise and may want to chime in as well. But you, uh, the census data are wonderful in, in, to the, with all the warts that they have uh, that we, we know about. But one of the issues for the redistricting uh, data, uh, the data that's required for redistricting, is that they don't include current and good precinct geography for which you can then produce the data that's necessary to evaluate, you know, uh, competitiveness, et cetera. Uh, the, the process is one, for those who don't know, that where they, they do collect from the states information about the boundaries of precincts uh, where the election results are reported, uh, you know, but, uh, but it's done in, in so early in the process that you have to use only the 2008 uh, geography of the precincts, for example, and the issuance of the final uh, geography, for the Tiger files uh, for the process it comes really late in the process. And so it makes it very difficult to come up with good, accurate data uh, for, the, for, for doing redistricting. I've heard from somebody that there is actually discussion, maybe even a pilot project or development of something at Census in which they would try to automate the process of, uh, of adding the precinct geography 
to their tiger file in a much uh, more um, current, uh, up-to-date kind of way. I don't know if you've heard that as well, but I'm, I'm curious as whether or not that's in the works. Yeah, I, I don't know, and I would send you to the geography division, you know, to make, because to, I, I wouldn't want to say, but the point that you're making uh, about the disconnect between the electoral ge geography and basically the, what I called enumeration or collection geography is a really important one. And it's actually um, the legacy of the, the 1920s um, um, lack of apportionment because for 40 years between the 20s, I, this is in the paper, it's not, um, I didn't talk about it today, but for 40 years, the Bureau was freed up, if you will, from having any, anybody from any political branch ever ask them to align their geography with the um, with any electoral geography. Lots of other people did come at them, mostly um, cities and local areas that wanted health districts and census tracts and so that there was, so the small area data tabulations that they developed between the 20s and the 60s were, don't measure um, you know, are me are, you know, don't measure electoral geography, and that's what became qu quite obvious in 1970, when um, the uh, le state legislatures and the state data officials began to take a look at what they were likely to get after the 1970 census and threw up their hands in despair. Right. So we've been we the uh, the Census Bureau is very unhappy about undoing all these their geography because of course mapping 8.25 million blocks is no mean task, right? They do use it for collection so that what I, s the problem I see is the, is the, um, is, is actually a very deep and fundamental one about the um, sort of intergovernmental relations and who gets to tell what to whom, right? Which is why Congress finally had to come in and pass um, uh, PL 94-171, which clarified who had the responsibility to set standards when and, and why? And it's still an ongoing process. Now, it has gotten much, much easier as the technology has developed. But there are, um, if, you know, if you go into the Census Bureau, they still don't necessarily see the, the, the PL requirements as their main task. Right, because that because it, that's just one file. It's and in fact, the, because it needs to be dumped out so quickly after the census, um, they sort of get it out the door, and then it becomes a kind of orphan, and they move into the what I call the the summary file. So SF1, SF2, you know, if you're a census junkie, you know about this stuff. Um, and they never, you know, they don't look back, if you will. Data's out there, whatever. Right. Um, so, what's the use of having the precinct boundaries delineated in census geography? There's um, two purposes. Uh, one we've already been talking about is like be able to value the political consequences of redistricting plan. Um, the other purpose is um, to um, uh, do voting rights analyses. And so that's um, a very important, uh, especially in Section 5 covered jurisdictions, but elsewhere too. Um, as to uh, why you would do this. Now, um, we identified through um, uh, our work and our, our advisory board that uh, one of the um, reasons why a jurisdiction may not decide to participate in phase two of the redistricting data program, which is when these boundaries are transmitted to the Census Bureau for incorporation into the census geography, um, is that um, they don't want people to be able to evaluate independently um, the political consequences of the redistricting plans. Um, and so I've, for example, been talking with Janice Thompson, who's the common cause person in Oregon, and she's very frustrated that Oregon did not participate in phase two. And the, the people in, um, the politicians in Oregon really have no interest in, in ever doing that because they hire an outside consultant to collect these um, uh, boundaries and overlay them onto the census geography and um, they're able to do their partisan gerrymandering without any um, oversight uh, from the public. So um, I, I would like for all states to participate. Um, uh, now um, some states, uh, if, if we're thinking about best practices or, or um, how to 
uh, get these data so that they're um, usable, um, not just f um, you know for the long term of maybe 2008, 2010. Um, some states, um, once they draw the boundaries, they are static throughout the entire decade. Um, some states, once they're transmitted to the Census Bureau for incorporation into the census geography, they are frozen in place at that point in time um, until after the redistricting happens. Um, and then there are other states that uh, don't transmit their boundaries correctly, um, that uh, um, don't transmit them at all or uh, change their boundaries. Uh, even between um, the time that they're transmitted and the 2008 election. Um, so uh, it becomes a bit he big headache when you're working with these data, and there's a lot of error that's involved in it um, as well. Um, I, I think if there was going to be a, a best practice for Ohio, because Ohio is not one of the states that really participates um, with phase two, um, would be that sort of state where uh, the, that um, scenario where you transmit the boundaries and um, then freeze them until after um, the census, uh, after the redistricting is done. Also add that just on top of that, just because the boundaries exist doesn't mean that the electoral data connected to it right. are easy to get to. That's, that's true too. <laughs> um, a question about Ohio. Um, Mike, if I'm not mistaken, it was either you or Justin Levitt mentioned to me a couple years ago, please correct me, that the way Ohio has structured its um, creation of the state Senate, it, it, the state Senate, it basically insulates one political party in control of the state Senate. And, and I'm wondering if I understood correctly, and if so, I'm wondering about whether there's any legal remedy available outside the legislative remedy if they, if, if truly by law, by the operation of law, it, we've just, instituted one party control over one house of our state Right, so Oregon, I mean Oregon, Ohio has one of the most elaborate geographic criteria for state legislative redistricting in the country. Um, there's a hierarchy of geographies that um, can be split and it starts all the way down at the ward and precinct level and uh, works its all the way up through townships and counties, etc. And, um, uh, and those splits have to be minimized in a certain um, uh, mechanical fashion as well. And so um, uh, as part of a Joyce-funded project uh, over the, the decade, um, I had mappers drawing districts in, um, on, in Ohio and elsewhere in the Midwest. And um, we were finding some of what Micah was mentioning earlier about the, um, the, how the geographic distribution of Democrats concentrated in urban areas works against them in terms of redistricting, uh, if you're gonna draw compact districts, for example. Not always, um, and there's a, another project that Jonathan Rodden um, from Stanford, who's also uh, finding a similar finding as well. So, um, and this goes back to the 1970s at least, that this is con conventional wisdom. Uh, in uh, geographers and political science. So, um, um, uh, but I, I challenged my uh, mappers at one point to follow, not even closely, strictly follow the Ohio um, criteria. So I even gave them a little bit more leeway um, to draw a partisan democratic gerrymander following the state constitutional criteria um, uh, in Ohio. And they couldn't produce a democratic favored map now this was with 2000 data, um, and uh, I do, uh, I understand um, that, though I, I've never seen the analysis, that that was verified by the National Democratic Party as well. Uh, so uh, there was an opportunity for the uh, Democrats to um, have a, some sort of bipartisan um, effort to reform the process for state legislative redistricting in Ohio. And uh, at the time, Democrats thought that, well, they were going to control the apportionment board, and that was going to be enough for them. And I tried to warn uh, people that even if control is not going to be enough, sufficient, um, but you know, nonetheless, they, they um, thought that the control was going to be enough. And the, um, of course, uh, that control didn't uh, persist after the 2010 election. And so you know, they missed the boat, is, in my estimation. Um, uh, they uh, got a little greedy and, um, and are paying the, the consequences of that um, uh, with the latest portion board. Of course, 
we're likely going to see legal challenges to it. Speaking of which, <laughs> I, so yeah, our, our state constitution is really a mess when it comes to drawing state legislative districts. It's actually impossible to comply with all right. of the requirements of the Ohio Constitution. Uh, my question is actually for the other Michael. Um, three judge courts. Um, so uh, I actually have a couple questions. First is. Um, um, on the on the issue of why we have them at all, I mean, it seems to me one of the things this does is puts a lot of pressure on the Supreme Court, gets it up to the Supreme Court more quickly, and puts a lot of pressure on the Supreme Court to issue a published opinion. They can, of course, summarily affirm, but that has precedential effects. So if they want to say something different from what the three judge court says there's a lot of pressure on them to do so so I'd love your thoughts on that the second question is boy what seems most problematic about this to me is the ability of the chief judge to stack the panel um, and it seems like there's also a really easy legislative fix for that just require that all three of the judges be chosen by lot uh, and it, it, you know, it's the kind of thing that might actually not, might be, might be agreeable to people on, of both, uh, both Democrats and Republicans in Congress. So has that been proposed and is there any chance of something like that getting anywhere? Okay. Uh, on, on the first one, uh, the, um, not to get too technical uh, here, but the, uh, uh, first of all, just uh, for whatever it's worth, just statistically over the long life of, of the three judges to court from 1910 to the present, even in its you know, limited version from 1976 to the present, uh, the, 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 um, um, the, um, I think I'm fair to say most of the direct appeals, and of course not every three judges to court decision, you know, it's, it has to be appealed, right? It's, you know, uh, and probably most aren't, but those that are appealed, there's a direct appeal to the Supreme Court, and I think just most of them are, are in fact, summarily um, affirmed. There's an important election, uh, Voting Rights Act case, Cox versus Larios, I think it's called, uh, that was summarily um, affirmed uh, um, in 2003 or something um, uh, like that, but, but the, um, but some are, you know, decided by full opinions on the merits. It's a much higher percentage than yeah, granted. I mean, the, the, you know, the vast majority of of, uh, of cert petitions are are, um, are denied. But to, an, but to answer your question, my, my understanding is that the uh, summary affirmance does have precedential effect, but only for that case. It does not have. It doesn't bless the reasoning of the district court, whatever it may be, for the rest of the country. It only has precedential effect for that, you know, a, a kind of law of the case sort of thing for that particular case. That's my understanding. The Supreme Court itself has said that in other, um, uh, in, in other cases. So um, um, on, on, on the um, uh, second point about the possibility of a panel, you know, stacking, which, you know, should be worrisome for those of you who perhaps are less, you know, have, uh, are, are, are more, you know, worried about the, the uh, uh, you know, partisan slash political decision making by federal uh, 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 judges. Um, the, the, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, you know, I just reiterate that the evidence, at least the way I see it, uh, uh, shows that that's not, you know, being uh, done in these, it, it's not, uh, what, you know, uh, it, it's, um, th there, there's not a lot of hardcore evidence that chief judges are stacking these three judge panels and reapportionment or even pre-reapportionment, you know, pre-1976 cases um, either, but that's something for, worthy of further study. But to the extent that's a problem, as you say, sure, I mean, there could be a legislative fix. I, I agree that the stat, the three-judge district court statute simply could be amended to provide for, you know, uh, random uh, assembly of, of the judges like is done for, you know, just any case you file in federal court with a single district judge that at least within that district, there's a random assignment of the case to that particular, to any given federal district judge in, in the district and kind of in a parallel fashion, you could do that, you know, uh, to, to assemble a three judge district um, court and you could take it entirely out of the hands of, 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 of the, you know, of, of, of the uh, um, 
of, of the chief judge. I'll just mention real quick one, one further point to that. I'm thinking more of the uh, of some of the commentary, and especially in the 1970s, that led up to the you know the, the restriction of three of the of the three judge district court to reapportionment cases. I'm reminded um, actually uh, Henry Friendly, Judge Henry Friendly, talked about this, and others uh, did too. Some of them said that that they're actually that that the three judge district court actually that you should the statute should mandate that the that there be judges from different federal judges from different political parties you know it'd be a problem of exactly how you how you measure that i mean you know is, it would it be self identification would it be the party of the of the appointing president that would be problematic um, to, to do that but but to deliberately make it kind of bipartisan i guess if that's the right um, um, a word, and that's sort of almost the opposite. Uh, not maybe not quite the opposite, but quite a, you know a different idea than you just um, presented. And you know I'm not saying that's a good idea, but that's you know that that was that was discussed. But but um, uh, uh, but you know that, um, I don't think there's been a you know formal proposal to do what you said. But I, it, it's 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 a uh, uh, it's something to think about. Okay, we have time for one more quick question. Well, I just can't let it go unsaid that there were several uh, redistricting reform proposals in the last General Assembly here in Ohio. And the one that um, it gets talked about the most still today ended up um, the Ohio Supreme Court would be the one who would be the final decision maker if there was gridlock. And the Ohio Supreme Court, of course, being mostly Republican, I think all Republican at the time, and shown to have acted in partisan ways in the past. So, you know, there's... Uh, there's a lot of blame to go around for that not happening. It's unfortunate that it didn't happen, but I just had to get that in there. Thanks. Okay, well, we have covered a huge amount of ground this afternoon and all day. I think the first thing we're going to do is uh, give a round of applause to this panel. <laughs> Not all of our speakers have been able to remain for the day, but I think we should uh, give one last round of applause to all of our speakers. <laughs> and um, I'm going to exercise the prerogative of closing things up, but before I do that, uh, there are some folks who need to get recognized. Uh, not the least of whom are Jared Gregory, who's up in the corner, um, Alice Simon back there, and where's Nancy? Okay, and, and Nancy Pratt, our academic centers folks who did all of the heavy lifting to make the details of this program work, worked with our out-of-town speakers, uh, made the arrangements for accommodations, for dinner and food, so thanks to them. And, and finally, um, in my role as faculty advisor to the Law Review, uh, I want to thank the Law Review editors and staff for doing such a terrific job here. And I want to single out two people in particular. One is John Murray, the editor-in-chief. Um, and last but by no means least is Andrea Lee, who has just been a tower of strength through all of this from the time that we first started talking about doing any kind of symposium. This would never have happened uh, without Andrea, so thank you. And with that, we're adjourned, and uh, I'm, you're, feel free to continue the conversation for as long as we can keep going. <laughs>